I'm getting this out a little bit later than I intended, but uh, I wanted to just do a midweek update. No promises on the length of time. We're going to take a look at some cultural things that I think are pretty important about what's going on and about how people are being treated uh, on social media, by the media, and that sort of thing. Uh, some of the things I'll discuss in more detail on Sunday, but there were a few things that uh, I just didn't get to last Sunday that I wanted to uh, pick up on. So let's get right into it and let's get out of here. So this is an interesting article from Reason Magazine. Climate change. To stop climate change, Americans must cut energy use by 90%. Live in 640 square feet and fly only once every three years, says study. Here's what the article says. In order to save the planet from catastrophic climate change, Americans will have to cut their energy use by more than 90%, and families of four should live in housing no larger than 640 square feet. At least that's what a team of European researchers at the University of Leeds say. Travel should, in any case, be limited to between 3,000 to 10,000 miles per person annually. In addition, food consumption per capita would vary depending on age and other conditions, but the average would be 2,100 calories per day. Uh, each individual is going to be allocated would be allocated a new clothing allowance of nine pounds per year, and clothes may be washed 20 times annually. The good news is that everyone over age 10 is permitted a mobile phone and each household can have one laptop. I would suggest that uh, people who come up with uh, nutty ideas like this might be sentenced to live in an 8x8 uh, cell of 64 square feet or let's be generous and make it uh, 9x9, 81 square feet. Um, the researchers, uh, this article says, Vogel and his colleagues are undaunted by the fact that there are absolutely no examples of low energy societies providing decent living standards as defined by the researchers themselves for their citizens. Co-author of the article said this, we also found that a fair income distribution is crucial for achieving decent living standards at low energy use. So in other words, we're going to do something uh, that nobody's ever done, that nobody's been ever able to do, and we're going to do it in a very fair way. So we're going we're to make uh, everybody will be equal in their misery. It's a crazy thing. <coughs> now, the next uh, thing that I want to talk about is a uh, incident that happened at the Ohio State Legislature about a week ago. Uh, there was a bill pending before the legislature to allow athletes, collegiate athletes, to earn compensation for the use of their name and likeness. Uh, there's already been contracts across the country that have been signed with some athletes in these NCAA schools. But uh, Jenna Powell, who is a Republican legislature, legislator, she's about 27 or 28 years old, from the Greenville, Ohio area, a graduate of Liberty University, introduced an amendment to the bill that would have restricted trans, uh, males, transgender males from competing in female sports at the intercollegiate level and colleges funded in uh, by the state of Ohio. That would include Ohio State and Ohio University and some other state institutions. And then all the other colleges that are in Ohio. Um, she gets up to introduce this in the House, and I want you to listen to what happened as she began to talk about this bill. Uh, you will hear that, well, just listen to it. The chair has the amendment. The amendment appears to be in order. The representative may proceed. Wonderful. The Save Women Sports Act is a fairness issue for women to be able to achieve their dreams and athletics in our state. And it's crucial to preserving women's rights and the integrity of women's and girls' sports. Across our country, female athletes are currently losing scholarships, opportunities, medals, education, and training opportunities. This amendment will require schools that are part of the OHSAA 
okay, to designate separate teams for participants of the biological sex. No school inter no school interscholastic conference or organization that regulates interscholastics shall permit biological males to participate on athletic team or an athletic competition designated only for biological female participants. Currently, OHSAA allows biological males to compete against biological females if they either completed a year of hormone therapy, demonstrated they do not possess physical. Well, that was uh, a representative, a Democratic representative from Lakewood, Ohio, up in the Cleveland area named Mike Skindell, who was objecting to this. To me, the whole thing sounded demonic. But this is what happened when, so this is a woman speaking at a bill that's designed to protect women, and this guy won't allow that to happen. This is because the left doesn't want to hear any idea that, that is not, or that's contrary to what they believe. The other thing, and I'll just discuss this a little bit briefly, maybe more detail on Sunday, uh, this is an article in the New York Times uh, by a supposedly conservative author. One of the authors is David French, who used to write for National Review, who seems to have gone completely down the tubes, in my opinion. Uh, he seems to be pushing a lot of left-wing ideas. Uh, he's now the senior editor of the Dispatch. Uh, one of the others is a professor of philosophy at Yale University a contributing uh, writer for the Times Magazine, and then um, uh, Camille Foster is the co-host of a podcast called The Fifth Column. So in this article, this editorial op-ed in the New York Times, what they say is that uh, these states that are attempting to ban uh, the teaching of critical race theory in schools they're just off base. We should we should allow this to happen. And this is what's happening is that the people who are advocating the teaching of a critical race theory are uh, engaged in a bunch of straw men arguments. These are they're creating things that don't really exist. I don't know of anybody that says never talk about critical race theory or its development or where it came from. The problem that's happening is in the um, the, the, the problem is in the implementation of policy based on critical race theory and anti-racist anti uh, thought that's come out. It, look, it started in law school, Harvard Law School, uh, but there was critical theory also developed in, in Marxist thought. Uh, as I mentioned, I, a book I had to read in graduate school was a, a small book called Critique of Legal Order by a guy named Robert Quinney. And Quinney's position was that, you know, that everything was a power structure, everything was against, uh, to design to oppress people by the capitalist system. It, it was Marxist in its orientation. So now that uh, they're trying to implement these things, they're adopting policy based on this, so now what's happening is the people that are in favor of teaching critical race theory and pushing this agenda to implement the policy are saying that the people that oppose it, well, you're just trying to shut down free speech. We're not really teaching critical race theory. You don't know what you're talking about. Critical race theory is only in law school. This is something different. We're just trying to teach the truth about uh, racial problems that existed in the United States and existed in every other culture. In fact, I heard a radio commentator today said, so look, you hate America, you hate what America did, you hate that America had slavery, but tell me any other culture in 1776 that came up with the Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal. So you see tweets from Maxine Waters, Cory Bush, one of the members of the quote squad, that just come out this week because it was the 4th of July when we celebrate the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, talking about how they hate America. America has never been free, and America is still oppressive. It's just a, it's just insanity. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to tear down the whole thing. 
So in response to all these people who say, well, we're not teaching critical race theory. What are you talking about? We don't really, you're just making this up. You're just trying to create political talking points. So here's an article from the New York Post, CRT Double Down, Critical Race Theory Double Down, Top Teacher, teacher Union Stands by Lesson. Here's what the beginning of the article says. The largest educators union in the country has vowed to fight back against those opposed to teaching critical race theory in schools and reiterated its support of the controversial 19 or 1619 project, which I've stated in the past is just a piece of uh, remade up history. But look at what the, so uh, in order to analyze this, I went to the National Education Association website. Uh, they were having an annual, a virtual annual meeting, and they had a new business item, 39, and the action was adopted as modified. So I want you to see what's said in this. So, so now understand that uh, the head of the American Federation of Teachers came out today and said, well, we don't really, we don't teach critical race theory. We don't know what you're talking about. We, we don't do critical race theory in schools. You, you people are just making this all up. So this is from the National Education Association. Now, this is a screenshot of their webpage as it existed yesterday. Today, of course, this item has disappeared. Uh, but there are some articles out there where you can find this particular archived, this page archived. But I have a screenshot of it. This is taken directly from the National Education Association website. So this is what they think that they want to do. Share and publicize through existing channels information already available on critical race theory. What it is, what it's not. Have a team of staffers for members who want to learn more and fight back against anti-CRT rhetoric. Point B, provide an already created in-depth study that critiques empire, white supremacy, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, racism, patriarchy, cis-heteropatriarchy, cis-heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, anthro Pocentrism and other forms of power and oppression at the intersections of our society, and that we oppose attempts to ban critical race theory and or the 1619 Project. So my question is, if they're not teaching critical race theory, why are they worried about people who are trying to ban critical race theory? The obvious answer is they are teaching and advocating teaching critical race theory. Parts, point C, publicly convey its support for the accurate and honest teaching of social, just, social studies topics, including truthful and age-appropriate accountings of unpleasant aspects of American history, such as slavery, the oppression and discrimination of indigenous, black, brown, and other peoples of color. Uh, by the way, um, Brandeis University has come out with a list of words that you're not allowed to say, and you're not allowed to say people of color. You're not allowed to say African-American either. Um, so... This is this is all just Marxist thought control stuff. Um, here's what it says. The association will further convey that in teaching these topics, it is reasonable and appropriate for curriculum to be informed by academic frameworks for understanding and interpreting the impact of the past on current society, including critical race theory. So... This all this that all this nonsense that they're saying is that we don't teach critical race theory is just a big fat lie. Again, here it says, uh, join with Black Lives Matter at school in the Zen Education Project. Howard Zinn was a historian that uh, wrote probably the most distorted uh, history of American of American history uh, ever. And of course, this is the one that's used uh, throughout a lot of colleges, high schools, and other educational institutions. So they're going to join with the Zen Education Project. I mean, Zen was a radical leftist. He cared nothing about the truth. But look at this. We're going to do this, George Floyd's birthday, as a national day of action to teach lessons about structural racism and oppression followed by one day of action that recognized and honor lives taken, such as Breonna Taylor, Philando Castillo, and others. 
the NEA shall publicize these national days of action to all of its members. Then they also say this, we're going to conduct a virtual listening tool that will educate members on the tools and resources needed to defend honesty and education, including but not limited to tools like what? Critical race theory. They will also commit President Beck Becky Pringle to make public statements across all lines of media that support racial honesty in education, including but not limited to critical race theory. Um, now they say, well, implementing this will be expensive and we don't really have the budget. Christopher Rufo, who writes for City Journal, also has his own website, uh, Christopher Rufo, Rufo, R U F O. Dot com. I would highly recommend that you follow him on Twitter. Um, he's posted, he posts a lot of this information. And he's being raked over the coals by a lot of people. But this week he was given access to uh, critical race theory being implemented at yet another corporation, Raytheon, a large defense contractor. Look at what some of this says these are actual screenshots from the materials used in the Raytheon indoctrination of its employees. Understand and share what the fund the defund the police really means. Listen, in this nonsense that Jim Zuckerberger was saying uh, during her uh, daily or almost daily Orwellian uh, Ministry of Truth uh, broadcast where she gets up and makes up all of this nonsense she was trying to say that it was republicans who were trying to defund the police not democrats it's just the lying that goes on in our culture right now particularly on the left is just it's shocking um so that's that's one thing then they here's another one you need to de this is what they're telling Raytheon employees. You need to decolonize your bookshelf. Here's another one. Participate in reparations. One way is through this Facebook group. Remember reparations isn't just monetary. Another one is find and join a local white space to learn more about and talk out the conscious and unconscious biases us white folks have. If there's not a group in your area, start one. In other words, you got to do some self-indoctrination to uh, get over your racism, even though you may not be racist. Uh, and then this is another, this is a common theme throughout these um, indoctrination sessions is they, they don't really want equality, it's about equity. And you can kind of see from the picture here is that they want the same outcome. Um, equal treatment and access to opportunities help us perform our best, but we really need to be striving for equity where we focus on the equality of the outcome, not the equality of the experience by taking individual needs and skills into account. So we want to make everybody equal. This is the Marxist dream. Uh, the leftist stream. So this is this is where this is going. Now the other thing that we're seeing happen too is we see this rise of uh, dividing people into tribal groups and making people racist that might not be racist or making people think they're racist when they're not really racist is the rise of anti-Semitism. So Yale College, which was founded as a Christian institution to train ministers, um, came out this week, the Yale College Council adopted a statement of condemnation against Israel. So it talks about Sheikh Jarrah. I've talked about Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood. These were people who were essentially squatters, not paying rent, and they've gone through the courts. And this case has been dragging on for four decades almost, where they're trying to get these people evicted. And it was the attempts to evict them and the decision by the Supreme Court in Israel that said they could be evicted that sort of led to some of this uprising in Jerusalem, particularly around the uh, Damascus Gate, which is close to the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, uh, sort of over in the area of the Garden Tomb if you've been to Israel. And then that led to further demonstrations on the Temple Mount, which led to 
uh, the Israeli police cracking down, which led to the rockets coming from Hamas in Gaza and Israel fighting back and taking out these uh, missile launching sites and surgical strikes. And by the way, the recent statistics that I saw showed that um, of the 240, roughly 240 people in Gaza killed, about 90 of them had been killed by Hamas rockets that fell short, that didn't make it to Israel. Of course, this has led, as I've noted, uh, some people suggesting that, well, it's just not fair that Israel doesn't shoot down the rockets that are going to hurt people in Gaza. Uh, so anyway, look at what this Yale College Council statement says against Israel. Most recently, Israeli forces have attacked Palestinian worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque. This thing is just filled with a bunch of lies, using stun grenades, tear gas, and rubber-coated steel bullets. Those things happened, but it was happened because they had gathered together rocks and other things, uh, fireworks to shoot down on worshippers at the Western Wall. Uh, below uh, below where the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock are. Um, Israel's intensified airstrikes and military attacks on Gaza, winning hundreds of Palestinians, demolishing more than 11 residential buildings and killing 14 kids. It uh, goes on, as Yale students, we condemn the injustice, genocide, and ethnic cleansing occurring in Palestine. Uh, we emphasize this is not a political issue. Israeli f forces are acting in clear violation of international law and are conducting egregious human rights violations against the Palestinian people. Listen, this this is all just a bunch of lie. Here it says here, just as Israel's military enforces the apartheid system against Palestinians, the U.S. police enforces the system of white supremacy against black Americans. The fight against Israel's apartheid is interconnected with the fight to defund the police in the U.S. Oh, wait a minute. I thought they were not involved in defunding the police, that that was the Republicans who were involved in defunding the police. Somebody needs to get to the Yale College Council and tell them that they're they're off. Uh, they're not they're not getting their talking points straight. They're messing up their talking points. Our goal is to create a collective liberation movement that stands against racial injustice and policing worldwide, from Minneapolis to Palestine. So listen, this is a worldwide movement. They're trying to do this, and there's a rise in anti-Semitism. This is not surprising coming from Yale. I remember. Uh, firing line debate that William F. Buckley had many years ago. Uh, I think I was in high school. Um, I used to watch it when I came home from high school, uh, these fire line, firing line debates. I loved them at that time. And uh, Buckley was debating a... He was introduced as the leading socialist in America. And then during the introduction, it also said that uh, Yale students had voted overwhelmingly for McGovern in the 1972 election. So now I think about it, 1972 election occurred while I was in college. I think it was in the summer when I was home from college working uh, back in Pennsylvania. But anyway, Buckley got up and said, well, you know, um, the fact that the Yale undergraduates supported McGovern is hardly surprising because it was always my contention that McGovern was the candidate of choice among the incompletely educated. And then he also said that I was interested to see how my opponent, uh, my esteemed opponent in this debate, was uh, um, um, introduced as the leading socialist in America, which to me seems rather like pointing out the tallest building in Wichita. Uh, Buckley was a great debater. But back to the rise of anti-Semitism. One of the other places that anti-Semitism has arose is in the, uh, among the squad, Ilan Omar is an example. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to early June when she made some statements that people interpreted, which rightly interpreted, as anti-Semitic. So first here are those statements, then I'm going to play an interview that took place the other day 
uh, of her by Jake Tapper on CNN asking her these questions and watch how this person has no familiarity with the thing that we like to call the truth. So the first thing she says is that in her tweet, we must have the same level of accountability and justice for all victims of crimes against humanity. We have seen unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban. I asked Secretary Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, where people are supposed to go for justice. So you see how the atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban are all presented in an equivalent manner. So here's the interview with Jake Tapper, just a couple minutes long. Uh, on the subject of the Middle East, you upset, as you know, uh, many of your fellow House Democrats uh, after comments you made earlier this month about the U.S. and Israel. You were questioning Secretary of State Blinken about where victims of war crimes could get ju justice. Uh, you made comments to him and also you tweeted, quote, we must have the same level of accountability and justice for all victims of crimes against humanity. We have seen unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban, unquote. Um, ultimately, Democratic leaders said that equating the U.S. and Israel with Hamas and the terror and, uh, and uh, the Taliban, quote, foments prejudice. And as you know, a group of Jewish House Democrats wrote a letter to President Biden saying that accusing Israel of acts of terror, as you and other members of the squad have done, is anti-Semitic. Um, do you regret these comments? I don't. I, I think it's really important to think back to the point that I was trying to make. Obviously, I was addressing Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, the cases are uh, put together um, in front of the ICC. ICC has been investigating. I know that you know, some of my colleagues don't lend legitimacy to the ICC, but I tend to think uh, that people around the world uh, who have experienced injustice need to be able to have uh, a place where they can go. And as a country that helped uh, found the, the ICC and supported it, I think that it is really important for us um, to, to continue to find ways in which people can find justice around the world. Well, some of your fellow House Democrats um, have been frustrated, as you know. They've told you this uh, publicly, uh, and I'm sure private, possibly privately, um, because they want to join you in your fight for justice, but sometimes you've made comments uh, that make them, uh, that offend them. In 2019, you said lawmakers uh, support uh, Israel um, because it's, quote, all about the Benjamins, which implies that politicians only support Israel because of money. There was a tweet from uh, 2012 and when you said Israel had hypnotized the world. Do you understand why some of your fellow House Democrats, especially Jews, find that language anti-Semitic? I have welcomed any time, you know, my colleagues have asked to have a conversation, to, to learn from them, for them to learn from me. I think it's really important for uh, these members to realize that they haven't been partners in injustice. They haven't been, um, you know, equally engaging uh, in seeking justice uh, around the world. And I and I think, you know, I will continue to to do that. It is important for me as someone who who knows what it feels like to experience injustice in ways that many of my colleagues don't, uh, to be a, a voice in finding finding accountability, uh, asking for mechanisms for justice for those who are maligned, oppressed, um, and who have had injustice um, done to them. But what do you say to them? I hear everything you're saying about your fight for justice, but what do you say to them when they say, I hear what you're saying, but the terms you're using, the language you're using is anti-Semitic? No, I, and I hear that. I have obviously clarified and you know, apologized uh, when I have felt that my words um, have have offended uh, and it's really important right as I've explained to my colleagues they have engaged in Islamophobic tropes I have yet to receive an apology I think you know when we are engaging in a space where we don't know 
um, how our language will be uh, received. Uh, it is important for us to be open-minded. Uh, and I think I have always been someone who is humbled, uh, someone who understands how words can be harmful and hurtful to people. And I've always listened and learned and behaved accordingly uh, and showed up with compassion and care. And I certainly hope that the threats that you experienced in the past have, have gone away because that was horrific. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll just sort of let that one uh, hang out there. Um, the, the evidence uh, that you see there of a darkened heart and a darkened mind, um, it, it's... It, it's very sad on many levels, but it's also uh, something that needs to be pointed out. She, she's never apologized. She's never been open-minded. This is just these are just bold-faced lies. Uh, as one commentator that I like to listen to, Dennis Prager says, "The left lies with the ability with which you breathe, or as easily as you breathe." It's stunning. So let's take a look at the Middle East now. I'm going to, uh, I have some things on uh, uh, family reunification law and some of the infighting in Israel. The we talk a lot about is about this alignment of the nations and how things seem to be forming into this Turkey, Russia, Iran alliance. So I'm going to look a little bit at that, about some of the recent developments there that are not so much happening in Israel or even in Syria, but happening in another part uh, of the area around the Middle East that sort of indicate that things are coming into place for this Ezekiel 38-39 scenario to take place. Now, of course, it's controversial or it's not. There's not a lot of agreement on exactly when this Ezekiel 38, 39 thing takes place. I think it happens uh, later towards the end, along the time of the Armageddon campaign or as part of the Armageddon campaign. Uh, I've not always held that. I used to hold that it, held, it took place early in the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, but in any event, what we're seeing though is we're seeing this alliance coming together. So here's an article from, um, I think this comes from the Tehran Times, that Turkey-Russia ties are at a strategic cooperation level. Now you need to understand that Turkey, Iran, and Russia have competing interests throughout the Middle East and elsewhere. But what you see is you see these little alliances forming and coming together. They work past their differences, I guess is the best way of saying it. And I think that does fit very well with how the alliance is presented in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, here's another article. This is from Jewish, I'm sorry. Here's another article. This is from uh, the uh, Geopolitical Futures a new order in the South Caucasus. And so this, this is another area where Iran, Russia, and Turkey, while they have competing interests, they're sort of setting those aside to work together. One of the things that Russia really wants to do is to allow free trade to take place across Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia because of the oil riches in the Caspian Sea. Uh, there's railway and roads across there that they'd like to be able to use. But because of the conflict that's taken place between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, that has not worked out that well. But now they, they think that they have this sort of uh, calmed down so that they can do that. Uh, of course, Russia invaded Georgia a number of years ago uh, to impose its will on part of Georgia, particularly where there were ethnic Rus Russians. Uh, Turkey has some competing interests, but Russia has always had a problem with the South Caucasus uh, because of the heavy Islamic fluence there, uh, influence there. 
Also think that what you're going to see is you're eventually going to see Turkey rise to a position of more prominence. Whether that happens now or not, I don't know. Whether that happens under Erdogan or not, I don't know. I'll show you some things where Erdogan is trying to elevate that. Iran is sort of taking a stand and stand back and see approach, but it has uh, a lot of ethnic uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani uh, people within Iran. In fact, Ayatollah Khomeini comes from uh, Azerbaijani background. So you're so you're seeing this alliance forming, and so what you see happening in Syria, where they have somewhat competing interests but a lot of cooperation they also have competing interests but a lot of cooperation now in the south caucasus so that's just the my point is that it's further cementing the alliance that that i see forming i think you're going to see the turkey rise to a little bit of more prominence in this um the article concludes with this the big question is the limits of Turkish-Russian cooperation. While their respective interests may favor stability at the moment, the two countries have a history of warfare. Iran's presence mitigates the risk of a confrontation between them. So again, you're going to see sort of fits and starts in this alliance as they sort of work out their differences. But I also think you're going to see Turkey rise more with regard to the former Soviet Union stand republics, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and the other stand republics there in Central Asia that are in many respects oil rich, oil and resource, resource rich, but also have a strong ethnic tie and language tie to Turkey. The other thing that's sort of playing into this is the Iranian building continued to build, attempt to build this land bridge from Iran through Iraq and Syria and Lebanon all the way to the Mediterranean in an effort to get at Israel. That's its ultimate goal. So you see them pushing this in a number of ways, and there's been some developments there. Lindsey Graham was uh, interviewed, asked questions about what do you think about the uh, O'Biden administration and what they're trying to do with regard to uh, Iran. Here's what he had to say. Here's the game plan. Uh, number one, the Iranians are playing President Biden like a fiddle. Uh, the Ayatollah, Sean, is a religious Nazi. Hitler wanted a master race. The Ayatollah wants a master religion. They're trying to drive us out of Syria and Iraq so they can dominate Syria, Iraq, and Iran, the Shia Crescent. They're trying to build a nuclear weapon to hold the world hostage and one day destroy the state of Israel. They're on the path to accomplish all of that unless we make a correction now. I've never oh. been more worried than I am right now about a war between Iran and Israel. And I think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, there's a lot of talk about is Israel going to attack Iran? Um, this has been things that have been talked about, though, for the last uh, 10 years off and on as Iran has made threats. So in fact, there was a, an institute, CSIS, I think it was, that did a report back about 2005, I think I've referenced in the past a number of times, that wargamed a, a nuclear exchange between Israel and Iran and Syria. Uh, the conclusion of that, interestingly enough, was, and this is back before anybody thought that Iran had a nuclear weapon, just that they wanted to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, they put Syria in the mix because at the time, you might remember, Syria had a North Korean, in, uh, North Korea installed nuclear reactor along the Euphrates River. Um, in the area of Raqqa, where, uh, which would have fallen under the control of ISIS during that period of time that ISIS was rising uh, to power and did, and did uh, exercise power over a large chunk of Syria and parts of Iraq, including Mosul, Mosul the ancient city of Nineveh. But that was destroyed in a rocket attack, or a, a pretty stunning attack by Israel back in 2007, I believe it was. 
but anyway, so that's why Syria was included in the war game uh, analysis that CSIS did. CSIS did back in 2005. The conclusion of that, by the way, was that uh, Israel would continue on. They would have mass casualties, but they would continue. They would recover relatively quickly. Iran and Syria would essentially cease to exist as predominant or important political entities. Uh, but this is a problem. The UN chief came out this week and said that um, the U.S. should lift all sanctions on Iran that this is the way to go. This is just insanity. We know what Iran's going to do with this. Here's a blog from the Times of Israel that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is an imminent threat to U.S. forces. Uh, here's one of the statements in Syria. Iran is working to consolidate its influence while trying to prevent U.S. forces from gaining a foothold. Or in Qatar, the IRGC cuts forces in Qatar with Hamas or monitoring the U.S. forces and U.S. embassy daily. In other words, Iran really has its tentacles everywhere. Notably, the Iranian Revolutionary uh, uh, Guard, uh, the, I, this is the Iraq, the Iraq uh, militia, creates Iran's land bridge, connecting Iran through Iraq to Syria, Lebanon, and the Israeli northern fronts. And this land corridor will allow uh, the Quds Force to transfer arms and personnel through Iraq into Syria and Lebanon all the way to the Israeli front and the Mediterranean. In addition to Iran sort of continuing to uh, exercise its influence in this region, Turkey also continues with its rather massive projects. Uh, one of these is a thing called um, Canal Istanbul. Uh, this has been a pet project of, of uh, Erdogan for quite some time. Uh, it's, a, it's a desire to build a canal. Here's some, uh, this is an official Turkish government video about building this canal. Uh, this would be to the west of the, Bos of the Bosporus. Uh, because it's a choke point for tr uh, the sea traffic that has to go through there up to Crimea and Ukraine. But some of the big projects that Turkey has done, are they've built these massive dams. Uh, they can control and shut down the water flow in the Euphrates. And in fact, I think I might have a little something about this later. They're really causing a lot of problems with farms in the Euphrates Valley and Iran. This is... Uh, the new Istanbul airport, which is the largest airport in the world. This is opened uh, 2019, I believe. Uh, so this is, um, these are big projects that Erdogan has pushed. Uh, Turkey has also become a big uh, player in drone technology. Uh, that was used extensively in the war between um, Azerbaijan and Armenia. It's a game changer. But back, this is what they want to do is they want to create this canal west of the Bosporus to go from the sea near Greece and Turkey all the way to the Black Sea. It's a massive project. A lot of people say that it won't work, but Erdogan seems to be insisting on uh, doing this. And here you can kind of see the route. This is going towards the north, towards the Black Sea. Uh, so this is a massive project that Erdogan has been p pushing, but it's, it shows that even though Turkey's had a lot of economic problems, nevertheless, Erdogan is pushing Turkey in this attempt to recreate parts of the Ottoman Empire, the Neo-Ottoman Empire, if you will. Uh, it's part of the overall plan of Erdogan. Now, Erdogan's a big Muslim Brotherhood guy. He's trying to make nice with Egypt, but Egypt came back this week and essentially said, we're not interested. Uh, Erdogan had gone to Egypt uh, at the fall of the Mubarak regime. I'm pretty sure what the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt tried to do was to do in Egypt what it had taken 
Erdogan a decade to do, almost a decade to do in Turkey, to kind of bring in his expansive, Muslim expansive um, desires. Uh, so he had worked with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Of course, they overflew the Mubarak government and were in power for about a year before El Sisi came in. So El Sisi doesn't forget this. Um, here's what this article says in Al Monitor. Since 2013, Turkey, with financial support from Qatar, has gone to extremes to support the Brotherhood. Istanbul became a hub for Brotherhood members in exile. A retired Egyptian general speaking on condition of anonymity told Al Monitor, quote, Turkey not only harbors at least 25,000 terrorists with families, but also provides them with support to propagandize us against us through the media. They support guerrilla warfare in Sinai and deploy mercenaries into Libya right on our border for the fatuous dream of brotherhood rule. Despite his uh, public efforts to reach an understanding with Cairo, Erdogan still employs the rabbi of salute at his rallies. The other thing that Turkey has done, we've talked about this, I've talked about this quite a bit, is the blue homeland where Turkey says that they have rights to parts of the Mediterranean and Black Sea that exist, uh, that, that go far beyond what internationally recognized areas would be. And so Turkey's trying to shut down any pipeline from Israel, from the Mediterranean gas fields to, uh, to Cyprus, to Greece. He, Erdogan wants it to go through Turkey so he can get the tax things. And then this was uh, a couple of years ago in Yeni Safek, which is a, um, I think this was December 17th of 2019. This was an article uh, talking about we need to get all the Muslim countries to come together to go against Israel. This has, of course, huge implications. I mean, this is like everybody's who wants to do a map to show how Ezekiel 38 and 39 may come about. You see the forces coming from the Stan Republics in Central Asia. You see them coming from Libya. You see them coming from Sudan. I mean, this is this is a map that Erdogan, this is his main media mouthpiece. Uh, this is what they really wanted to do. So this is, so you have, you have Russia, Turkey, Iran, you have Iran doing things, you have Turkey doing things, you have Russia doing things to try to um, to get more influence in the area to the north of Israel. And this is, I think, prophetically significant. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about uh, uh, sort of the U.S.-Israel relationship with the new Israeli government. Uh, first thing that happened last week a little about a week ago was a meeting between um, the new foreign minister and I think sort of the shadow prime minister of Israel, uh, Yair Lapid, and uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State of the U.S. Here's a little clip of that meeting. Secretary Blinken and I represent new administrations. Yours a few months old, I was a few weeks old, almost a few days. But we also represent a very long and strong tradition of close friendship and cooperation. There is no relationship more important to Israel than the United States of America. There's no loyal friend to the United States of America than Israel. In the past few years, mistakes were made. Israel's bipartisan standing was hurt. We will fix those mistakes together. We will have disagreements, but they are not about the essence. They are all about how to get there. We want the same things. We sometimes disagree about how to achieve. Israel has some serious reservations about the Iran nuclear deal that is being put together in Vienna. We believe the way to discuss those disagreements is through direct and professional conversation not in press conferences. Uh, you rightly noted our strong support uh, for the uh, normalization agreements, the, uh, the Abraham Accords with uh, uh, Israel's neighbors and beyond. 
we strongly support this, uh, and uh, hopefully there'll be other participants. Um, I think we've also uh, discovered, or perhaps uh, rediscovered, that as important as they are, as vital as they are, uh, they are not a substitute for uh, engaging on the uh, uh, issues between Israelis and Palestinians that need uh, to be uh, resolved. Well, so the other thing that Lapid did, so you see how he sort of took this, took a slam at Netanyahu and how bad Netanyahu was. Well, at the same time, there was a, another speech he gave where he thanked Netanyahu. He went to the United Arab Emirates to open the Israeli em- embassy in Dubai. Uh, here's just a brief clip of his speech at that time. This is an historic moment. And it is a reminder that history is created by people. People who understand history but are willing to change it. People who prefer the future to the past. Well, um, I'll have more comments about this Sunday because I think this sort of plays into a, 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 a big problem in the new Israeli government with how they're going to put this coalition together, particularly with this guy, Mansour Abbas, who now it appears that he is acting as the mediator between Hamas and the Biden administration. He is a Muslim Brotherhood guy. And this is just sort of shocking that uh, the Bennett Lapid government is going to do this. And they're going to capitulate to, I think, a lot of Palestinian demands. And this, it never works that they give up land for peace. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, for example, uh, there was a settler outpost. Uh, Danny Gantz was involved in this, and essentially they agreed to uh, withdraw. They they left the buildings, but they abandoned the outpost that was built in the uh, near the Palestinian village of Beta in Samaria. Uh, this is a back to this question is are Israeli settlements valid at all within Judea and Samaria? Uh, this is this is going to continue to be an issue. Um, another thing I uh, uh, Yoram editor has uh, done good work on his blog. Uh, former ambassador to the U.S., if I recall correctly. Uh, he has an Edinger report. Uh, here is the thing. He says, the threat of Iran's atoll is track record versus speculation. U.S. policymakers who are negotiating a return to the 2015 Iran nuclear accord should be aware that the most effective pred- predictor of Iran's future behavior is its past behavior. Past performance, especially in the highly traditional Middle East, is a tangible an objective basis of assessment, while future behavior is subjective, speculative, and fraught with uncertainty. U.S. policymakers consider the Ayatollahs credible partners for negotiations amenable to peaceful coexistence and power sharing with their Arab Gulf states, notwithstanding the aforementioned track record, as well as Iran's fueling the civil wars in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, the persistent violent attempts by the Shiite Ayatollahs to topple every pro-U.S. Sunni Arab regime and the entrenchment of Iran's drug trafficking, drug trafficking and terrorist cells in South and Central America. Moreover, in order to advance negotiation with Iran, the U.S. has waived the military and regime change options, which is perceived by the Ayatollahs as weakness, as it would be by any rogue regime, especially in the Middle East. In fact, uh, Edinger was interviewed by uh, ILTV. Um, I'll get to that in a minute because I'll, I'll play that. It plays into it. Uh, another thing that happened, of course, there were these attacks that the U.S. did in um, in is uh, in western Iraq along the Syrian border, where they took out some of the military installations. Don't know that they were really effective, but it was an attempt to send a message. 
but it shows that there is this, we have a problem. The U.S. has a problem in Iraq. The U.S. has a problem. They had a problem in Afghanistan. Now we've abandoned Afghanistan, and I would expect Afghanistan to fall to the Taliban within a month. Now, remember I mentioned that the uh, Lapid, the foreign minister of Israel, and the shadow prime minister went to the United Arab Emirates to open the Israeli uh, embassy. Uh, just as I was getting ready to do this, there was a report of a very large explosion of an oil tank, a container exploded on a container ship, caused a big fire in the port, the main port area of Dubai, Jabal Ali port. Uh, you can see that this port is right in the heart of Dubai. Those, that's one of the, just to the, uh, this area right here is one of the Palm Islands. You see the other Palm Island. This, this was a proposed development called the world. It was to look like the world. It would sell islands to these rich people. You see Dubai, the Dubai uh, Marina. The Burj Al Arab, that large hotel, probably a thousand feet uh, tall, that looks like a sail. Uh, this is this is not an inconsequential thing. Uh, here is a this is a little video of what somebody saw from their high rise in Dubai, looking out towards the port. Uh, so this was this is a big deal. Now immediately. I think a lot of us are speculating that this might be from the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard causing some problems. Uh, that remains to be seen. People interviewed at the Port of Dubai said it was an accident. Another thing that you should be aware of is this development of all these different kinds of weapons and weapon systems. Uh, the drone technology, this is a, of course a very large drone that are being flown with the help of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, Russia and China have developed these hypersonic weapons that are difficult to defend against. against. The U.S. and Israel had an um, exercise to use microwave technology to take out dr swarms of drones. Uh, this is uh, one of the problems with uh, Israel. I think I played a video last week of Israel using a laser to take out an individual drone. But the problem is that the laser has to be on the drone for an extended period of time and the laser can only go after one drone at a time. So what Israel and the U.S. have been developing is some technology using microwaves to disrupt the electronics on the drones and deal with the drone swarm. Uh, the drone swarms were used really for the first time by Israel in the recent uh, Gaza war that took place back in May. Israel has also developed a new missile called the Sea Breaker. Uh, here is a little video about it. Essentially what this video shows is how these missiles are being developed by Israel. They come from the sea. They are uh, very precise in the way they can operate. They're very fast. They hug the ground, which makes the uh, anti-missile batteries harder for them to resist. Pretty amazing technology that's being developed. Uh, and you can see how it works. Uh, take out the enemy ship. So that's that's another that was just an accessory. It's another fifth generation missile that Israel has developed. Another thing that Israel has developed is a, a sort of a camouflage suit. Uh, to make soldiers more difficult to see uh, if people are using infrared. I've seen some of the uh, long-range pictures of this, 
and you can see the binoculars, but you can't see any person. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, a couple other things just to look at is that uh, there was a, a fairly important meeting uh, that took place between the president of Iraq and then al-Sisi from Egypt and King Abdullah II from Jordan. Uh, took place in Iraq. Uh, it's, they're trying to build this Arab alliance. I do think eventually there will be some success to this. I do think that this is part of Psalm 83, which I don't think has been completely fulfilled yet. Uh, one of the other things that you see is uh, Egypt and Sudan, which are Arab countries also, are upset because Israel's, or excuse me, Ethiopia is going ahead and filling that dam. But they had this meeting, uh, Geopolitical Futures had a good article on this about the problems that are inherent in trying, they've been trying to get this Arab alliance together forever. I think they will succeed for a short time, and I think that will play uh, into Bible prophecy. The other problem that's happening right now is there's a pretty bad heat wave in Iran and Iraq. That has stretched already um, degraded power grids to their um, to quite a significant degree. Look at this article from uh, the National that just came out. This will be this is Thursday's the Na uh, the National from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the electricity ministry. This is in Iraq. Uh, they need to get power from Iran, but Iran has a lack of power right now itself. So in Iraq, it says the national grid dropped at about 3 a.m. on Friday to about 4,000 megawatts of output from the average of 12,000 to 17,000 megawatts. And Iraq's power demand can exceed 25,000 megawatts in summer as people get on air conditioning. So they're having rolling blackouts. It's very, very hot. Um, another thing that's happening is that ISIS has been going around attacking some of the electronic transmission towers. Uh, this is causing a lot of unrest. At the same time, Iran itself is having a lot of power outages. Uh, Iraq is very dependent on Iran for power. Uh, this is a picture, this is a... Uh, Ishmael, Ismail Hania, the head of Hamas. Of course, he doesn't live in Gaza. He lives in Qatar, and he has one of the. He must get about an hour's uh, worth of barber's work on his beard done every day. I've never seen one that's so well kept. But he talks about he was he went to um, Mauritania, which is in West Africa, which is an Islamic country and he was given this a sword and this is significant because what the operation was called was a sword of uh, Jerusalem was the recent operation the dispute between Hamas and uh, Israel uh, he also went to Lebanon and met with uh, Nasrallah uh, here's the interview with um, Dr. Edinger talking about uh, what Israel, how Israel should view Iran. Well, the best uh, predictor for assessing the impact on the UN uh, is the past behavior of the UN. Well, the best uh, predictor for assessing the impact on the UN uh, is the past behavior of the UN and that past uh, behavior does not entice one to have, uh, I would say, any hope for improved uh, behavior. Uh, the attitude by the UN, or to be specific, the attitude by members of the UN. And I would point the finger especially at the European members of the UN uh, has been uh, abysmal. Uh, they have ignored the past performance of uh, Hamas, deluding themselves that Hamas is driven by uh, an uh, urge 
to improve standard of living, to improve the level of education and health, which has nothing, but absolutely nothing to do with the agenda, with the vision of uh, Hamas. Any assistance to Hamas is going to achieve exactly the same results as prior projects of assistance, by the way, to Hamas, as well as to their masters, namely the Ayatollahs of Iran. Any assistance is going to be dedicated by Hamas to bolster their terror machine, to bolster their missile uh, power, to improve the precision of the missile and to extract uh, more and more Israeli uh, blood. Uh, the same thing goes for an agreement uh, which will involve or will not involve uh, return of Israeli, uh, living Israelis and dead uh, Israelis. I think it's time uh, for the UN, it's time for the US, in fact, it's time for Israel also to realize that Hamas is not amenable to credible negotiation. Hamas was established, is operating for one specific goal, and this is the destruction of the Jewish uh, state. Okay, so, so, and the sooner... Well, so I was going to ask, you know, with, with everything that you're saying, especially considering, as you said, Hamas's uh, unmovable position, essentially, uh, back to Bennett and Biden, what do you make of their respective new stances, or so to speak, new stances. Is Bennett correct in holding firm to his negotiation conditions, or is a softer hand as advocated by the White House better suited, and, and why? Well, the, the, the way to deal with, with Hamas, uh, just like any other terror organization, is by defeating uh, Hamas, by defeating those terror organizations to attempt to achieve few more so-called quiet years has nothing to do with uh, relaxation of the atmosphere. Those years of uh, no terrorism, those years of no bombing uh, were dedicated to, to expand the firepower. By the way, both Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south, there's one way of achieving a victory over Hamas, and this is by demolishing its firepower. And I would say, especially the head of the snake, not the body of the snake, and the head of the snake are the so-called, the so-called uh, Hamas political uh, leaders. Uh, there's something which especially the US should realize. Hamas is a proxy of Iran's ayatollahs. Hamas is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And both the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the largest terror or, uh, Sunni organization in the entire world, both Muslim Brotherhood as well as uh, Iran, consider the US, not Israel, as their top uh, target. The aim of, uh, uh, of uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran is to eject to expel the U.S. from the Persian Gulf, from the Middle East, and to subordinate the U.S. to the Islamic Republic of uh, of Iran, the the, the pretense or the illusion that they are amenable to uh, to some gestures ignores the fact that, by definition, Iran as well as Hamas are not amenable to peaceful coexistence. All right, Ambassador, thank you so much. So Israel has these issues that it needs to deal with. We'll talk more about them on Sunday. But uh, all around Israel are states that are, they're not doing that well. Egypt is struggling. The water situation that's being exacerbated the, uh, by Ethiopia filling the dam is... Uh, having an impact on Egypt, and I think the stability of the regime there. The We saw the attempted coup in Jordan, so I think that there is a uh, potential for a lot of trouble politically or in the governance of Jordan. 
to the north. Uh, this is an article from uh, today's New York Times about the fact that this is a picture in Beirut. By the way, this is interesting that you see the billboard in this picture of uh, General Soleimani, who was assassinated in January 2020 uh, at the Baghdad airport. Uh, it's on a billboard in Beirut. Uh, there are long fuel lines. The economy is quite dire. Uh, the statement from the World Bank said that the financial crisis in Lebanon could rank among the world's three worst since the mid-1800s. Currency has lost more than 90% of its value and unemployment has skyrocketed. Um, there are people who were making $800 a month and getting by on that. There are teachers who worked all their life for a pension. There's no pension. Uh, those who have a salary who were making $800 a month, that money is now worth $80. They, they're major, I mean, this, Lebanon is on the verge of collapse. Uh, that raises the specter that uh, somebody like um, Hezbollah could step into the breach. They've had a political thing. So here's a speech that uh, Nasrallah gave on Monday. Of course, he's always at an undisclosed location in his little bunker. He hardly puts his head up um, because he would be probably assassinated if he did. But during this speech, he said this. There are no people in the Israeli entity. They are all occupiers and settlers. His speech on money was delivered at the opening of the Palestine is Victorious Conference convened in Lebanon to renew media discourse and manage the conflict with Israel. Nasrallah did not specify whether Arab Israelis were also considered occupiers and settlers. So Nasrallah, he's, he still had a problem with the cough. You could see there at the early part of the video. Um, he really came at the U.S. And like most Nasrallah speeches, they went uh, over an hour. Uh, he doesn't get them done very quickly. And I know that somebody's going to say, well, you don't get your prophecy updates done very quickly anyway. But... Uh, the point of all this is that Lebanon is a failed state. We, we pretend that there's a country called Lebanon. There's really not a country called Lebanon, but there are armed forces there. They do have some weapons and firepower. What happens to that when Lebanon falls? Does all that go to Hezbollah? Certainly that's what Iran and Hezbollah want to have happen. Uh, Jonathan Spire, uh, a week ago in the... Jerusalem Post talking about Iran digs deep and hollowed out Syria. Uh, this is a very important article. Friday, uh, July 3rd or July 2nd. Um, Jonathan is a, one of the best middle anal analysts out there. He, well, let me just read a couple paragraphs from this and you can kind of get the idea. The attacks by pro-Iran militias on U.S. positions in eastern Syria come at a time of significant diplomatic action on the Syrian file. These attacks also graphically demonstrate that the problem at the core of the current diplomacy over Syria, these attacks also graphically demonstrate the problem at the core of the current diplomacy over Syria. Significant Western-aligned Arab states, along with Russia, are seeking to normalize the international position on the Assad regime. This would involve the ending of the is isolation of the regime, its return to international forums, and the gradual easing, easing of sanctions. But this is a fool's errand, in my opinion, because we, we pretend that there's a Syria. There's a very little sliver of a part of a country that used to be called Syria that's controlled by the Assad regime. The rest is in a state of disarray. This is um, um, a big problem, as Jonathan notes. The problem is that while these efforts to normalize Assad's status are making some headway on the international level, the situation on the ground in Syria is far from normal. Rather, the Syrian regime is profoundly weak. Foreign powers maintain powerful military and political structures on Syrian soil, controlling territory without any requirement to seek the permission of the nominal government in Damascus for their activities. Most significant of these is the structure maintained by Iran, 
which was activated on Monday night in the Mayadeen region against U.S. positions close to the Al Omar, Omar oil field. The current direction of events points to the prospect of a kind of Lebanonization or Iraqification, if these are words, of Syria, that is, the emergence of a situation in which a weak government and name only exist and is accepted internationally. Beneath the flimsy structure, a powerful, independent Iranian political military capacity will have freedom of action, control significant territory, and be able to use the nominal central government as a useful cloak for its activities. So again, I think all of this turmoil, particularly in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in Egypt, uh, this is all very significant prophetically. Also Iraq. Uh, we we see this coalition in uh, Psalm 83. We see this coalition in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we see these things beginning to come together. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, share this video if you would. Uh, as I, we've sort of started announcing at FBC, we are trying to move to a separate platform to get away from some of the restrictions on YouTube. We were in sort of a form of YouTube jail. Uh, I had a number of friends over the last couple of weeks who have had their YouTube channels just summarily removed by YouTube. Um, people are being censored. It's pretty clear that that's happening. So we'll talk more about some of these issues on Sunday. Thanks for listening.